Amen. Give him praise. Give him praise. He is worthy of all my praise. God, would you just be in this place at this moment? God, would you shake us from the foundations of our feet, God, to the tops of our head with your spirit in this place? God, I believe you want to do a work in our lives. God, I believe you want to just do something that would just blow us away this morning. God, I pray that you would just reach down from heaven and touch the hearts and lives of people who are in this place who have never really understood the gospel. God, would you teach them, God, the gospel this morning through your word? Would you help us to see you, God, as believers, God, crucified on the cross? God, would you make it new to us, make it fresh to us again? We understand this Jesus we're following has given his all for us, that, God, we true can lay down our lives as we've just sung for you, to surrender ourselves completely to you, as Paul urges us to in Romans chapter 12, that we'd lay down our life a sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you, which is our reasonable service. Lord, would it be about that in our lives? We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can be seated. It's a great crowd this morning. I'm so glad that you are here. Um, it's so cold outside, and yet we're still a great crowd here. It's awesome. And so we're excited about that. I want to just take this opportunity to invite you to turn your copy of God's Word to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, chapter 19. The Gospel of John, chapter 19. We're going to look at two verses primarily this morning. John, chapter 19, verses 23 through 24. And we want to look at this new series that we're beginning. We're in a series on Sunday nights called The Easter Experience. The Easter Experience, in which we're going on, we call it Sendeo Sunday nights at 5 o'clock. We gather here, we'll watch a short video, we'll break up into small groups and begin to discuss what God's doing in our life as we see it in light of this Easter story that we um, have, that is the foundation of the Christian faith. Uh, that Jesus came, that Jesus died, and that Jesus arose again, uh, conquering death and became victory, uh, became victorious over death and our sin. And so we celebrate that. And so, but, but what we want to look at this morning and starting over the next six weeks is a sermon series to follow along with this. We want to find ourselves in the story of Jesus on the cross. And we want to look at the characters and the situations that have arisen from the story of Jesus. Listen, I want you just to hear me. Hopefully you've seen the compassion or the with the passion that the choir has sung and led, in which we have we've led up to this point. Listen, th- this, this should be celebratory that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that he has rose again, giving us victory. Listen, we should be passionate about this story. But what I find is it's all too familiar to us to really get excited anymore about. And I know that sounds bad, but there's very few times that the Easter story moves people today that have been in church a long time. And so I want us just to get in this story. And I want us to think about how Jesus would have, would have thought and how he would have felt as he hung on the cross. And so just if you'll go with me, I want to set the stage this morning before we read our text in John chapter 19. I, I kind of wonder what Jesus must have thought when he looked down at his bloody feet nailed to the cross and as his hands were there, and he, he couldn't even have enough strength to lift his head, he, he probably just had to sit there and look down at his bloody feet nailed to the cross. Possibly by this time, his vision would have been blurred, not just from pain, but also from the blood and the sweat that would have come down off of his brow with a crown of thorns that had been entrenched into his skull. And the blood would have been pouring down his face. He couldn't even move his hands to wipe the sweat and the blood off of his brow to keep it out of his eyes. This is the story of the crucifixion of Jesus, our Savior and our God. Probably the most painful, lonely, and desperate moment of Jesus' life was found in his final breaths upon the cross. As he hung on the cross for those six hours that Friday, I wonder, what did Jesus see? What did Jesus hear? How did Jesus experience the crucifixion? And that's what I want us to do over the next few weeks. What he witnessed was a number of people, a number of conversations around the cross, and whether they knew it or not, they were probably answering life's most important question. The most important question you can answer in your life is, who is Jesus to me? And these people were answering this question of life's most important question is, who is this Jesus that is on the cross? Who is this guy? And the most important question that we're still answering today is, what will we do with Jesus? 
You know, you've come here, maybe you, you know, you, you've been invited by someone this morning, or maybe you've been a church member all, all your life, or you've been in and around church all your life. Maybe you're a believer, maybe you're not a believer, but what are you doing with Jesus right now? What, what, what will you do with Jesus today and tomorrow and this point forward is a question that I think we have to ask ourselves. People, uh, perhaps the first people Jesus saw who uh, there at the cross as he was looking down in his blood-dripped feet was probably the soldiers, the Roman soldiers who would have hung him on the cross. He probably couldn't have helped but catch glimpses of them. And as he looks past his feet, he sees these guys who were down at the foot of the cross. And do you know what the soldiers were doing at the foot of the cross? They were playing. They were playing games. They were gambling for some of Jesus' clothes. The soldiers are all huddled in a circle, I can imagine. They're not concerned with what's happening on the cross above them. They're only concerned with what's going on around them in their circle. He's just another criminal to them. Get it with me. Get, get in your mind. I mean, sometimes I like to lay blame on the Roman soldiers. At least as a kid I did. I'm like, yep, yeah, it's all their fault. I mean, they just nailed him to the cross. How could they have nailed Jesus to the cross, mama? I remember asking questions like that to my mama. Anybody ever do that? Those Roman soldiers, they're horrible people. They would nail him to the cross. Here they are at the foot of the cross. They're gambling for his clothes. Listen, the reality is... He's just another criminal to them. He's just another Jewish rebel that they've been paid to do away with. And so they gamble for some of his clothes. The most significant, most significant event in human history, and they're completely oblivious to it. Listen, this moment in history defined everything that had happened to that point and everything that would happen from that point. Are you with me? And these soldiers are oblivious to the fact that Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Creator of the world, the King of all kings, and the Lord of all lords is the one that they've just driven nails into His hands and nails into His feet and crammed a thorn upon His head and stripped Him naked on the cross for everybody to see. And now He is there gasping for air. And they're completely oblivious to it. You see, they're playing games. Somehow they completely missed the one thing that had the power in their lives to change everything. And it's right before their eyes. Jesus is right there before them. And they quickly dismissed Jesus on the cross. Quickly. It was just another routine thing for them. So we read about these soldiers in several of the Gospels, but I want to bring light to specifically John chapter 19 this morning. Would you stand to honor the reading of God's Word? Here's what it says to us. You know the story. Jesus is already on the cross, and we pick up the story after uh, Pilate has told him what to write up on the, uh, the head of the cross. He said, do not write the king of the Jews, but he said, write, I am the king of the Jews. Okay, and this is Pilate's, Pilate's put this into place. And then in verse 23, here's what the scripture tells us according to John's account. It says, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to each soldier a part, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. And they said therefore among themselves, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it. Whose shall it be? That the scripture might be fulfilled, which says... They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore, the soldiers did these things. You may be seated, and thank you for standing to honor the reading of God's Word. There are some reasons that I believe the soldiers were so quick to dismiss Jesus, the Son of God, who was hanging upon the cross. I hope that you now have in your mind this story, this experience of Jesus. There are some reasons that these Roman soldiers were so quick to dismiss Jesus. There may be more than what I have found here in this text, but I want to share at least three of them with you this morning. Number one, familiarity. I'm a southern boy, I have a hard time with that word, just so y'all know. Familiarity. I don't know if I pronounced it exactly right. Some of you northern folks can correct me after the service. But familiarity, all right? Listen, it was familiar to them. They had seen all this before. These soldiers, they couldn't have cared less that it was Jesus there because Jesus was just another Jewish rebel criminal that they found 
that they were tasked by the Roman government to put upon that cross. He was just somebody else. The, kind of, uh, the law of familiarity kind of states this, no matter how valuable, given enough time, everything will be taken for granted. Everything can be taken for granted. That was true for these soldiers when it came to carrying out a crucifixion. The death penalty is very rare today. Sometimes it makes headlines because it is so rare. There are certain states that uh, obviously do that a little more than other states, and some states that don't do it at all. But in this day, I want you to understand that it was very common. It's very commonplace to kill people for their crimes. And so th- death by crucifixion was this common tool. And there's a book called Crucifixion by Martin Hingle, a professor of New Testament. He reports that during Titus' siege of Jerusalem, that up to 500 people a day were whipped, tortured, and crucified outside the walls of Jerusalem in hopes that they might keep people from rising up against the government. So they made examples of 500 people. Up to 500 people a day being whipped, tortured, and crucified. Tradition holds that when Jesus was a teenager... There was, a Jewish rebel- there was a Jewish rebellion near the town where he lived. The, the Roman army is said that crushed that rebellion to assure that it would never happen again. Get this. They crucified an Israelite every 10 meters along a road for a distance of 16 kilometers. This is familiar territory for these folks. Jesus would have seen this growing up. Most likely he would have walked down this path and over 1,600 people in a stretch of 10 miles would have been hanging upon a cross dying because they had rose up against the government. I want you to understand, like us, we we would say we've never been a part of seeing an execution. We've never been to a public hanging, most likely. We've never sat in when someone was executed by electricity or lethal injection for most of us probably. But listen, it's commonplace in this time. These soldiers had probably performed so many crucifixions that it was methodical for them. It didn't even get in their head anymore. Like, it's just what they do. It was a nasty job, but it was their job. And they performed it as they were accustomed to. You get the impression it just wasn't really a big deal. You get the impression that it was just another day at work. These soldiers had become so used to it, they had heard all the screams, they had seen all the grimaces, they had seen all the families gathered around the foot of the cross weeping and crying and begging for mercy for their family. They knew what to expect. In a matter of time, the breathing would secede. In a matter of time, he would be gasping for air, probably gargling for air, just to be real with you. And in a few moments, he would take his last breath, and then they could take the body, get the body down off the cross, and then they could go and have supper. They could go home to their families. I want you to see how routine and how normal this story would have been for these soldiers. It's easy to throw them under the bus and say, how could you do this? But listen, I, have to, I happen to see this same picture being portrayed in modern-day America today. Sitting in our churches today. Listen, we have... We have heard the story of Jesus so much that it is familiar to us. Church people, lost people, people off the streets, we've heard in the South this story so much. It's just familiar to us. You've probably had it illustrated to you numerous ways in Sunday school class as a kid. Some of us was raised up in the DVD technology, okay? For me, I was raised up in like the cassette tape world, all right? But some of you are raised up in the flannel graph board age. Okay, you guys will not know what this is, I assure you, okay? But no, they had this little board, and it had this little stuff, and you could cut Jesus out on a cross, and you could stick it up the board, and they would tell the story of, of Jesus being crucified, or the Sunday school story for the day. And so, and so listen, we've seen it depicted in, in dramas. You've participated in the dramas. Some of you have even been Jesus or you've been a Roman soldier. Listen, we have heard the story a thousand ways and a thousand different times in the ways in which we've heard them. This time of year, getting closer to Easter, and we'll start hearing the stories being taught and the, the sermons being preached and the videos being shared on Facebook, and we've been, we've been Jesus, we'll be Jesus to death over the next few, few months of the crucifixion. Please don't take that the wrong way. I'm glad it's out there. But the law of familiarity says it all becomes too familiar and all of a sudden it becomes less effective in what what it's been set out to do in our hearts. It becomes all so common to us. 
If we're not careful, we become just like these soldiers. It's all too familiar. We become calloused to the fact of the great sacrifice that's been paid on our behalf. It doesn't move us anymore. I was excited to hear what Lori had to share this morning because you can see in her heart that she's still moved by the gospel. God help us when we're no longer moved by the gospel. There are church members that are no longer moved by the gospel. I'm not just preaching to the lost this morning. I'm preaching to the saved on the pews this morning. If you're not moved by the gospel, something's wrong. Let the gospel move you today that Jesus died on the cross. He was buried. He's been resurrected the third day. And it's a personal sacrifice on on your behalf. Personal. We forget that apart from the cross, we'd still be dead in our trespasses and sin. We forget that we'd be spending eternity in a devil's hell apart from God. Will you do me a favor? Would you journey back with me just for a moment to the moment that the gospel was real to you, maybe for the first time? Would you just just journey back there? Maybe it was in a revival service. Maybe it was at a vacation Bible school. Maybe it was at a youth camp. Maybe it was on a Wednesday night like Lori. Maybe it was, I, I don't know where it was, a mission trip, an Easter Sunday morning service. What was it like to be moved by the crucifixion? What was it like to be moved by the the gospel message of Jesus being crucified for you and being raised again on the third day for you so that you could enter into the glory of heaven and the fellowship of God? What was it like? Would you just go there with me just for a second? Because it's hard for me to kind of grab. I was an eight-year-old on July the 25th of 1988 when I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And I remember for the first time truly being moved with the gospel that Jesus did this for me. It was in form of a song back in the days when we had stand up and sit down chords at Vacation Bible School. Dum, dum, you would stand up. And dum, dum, you would sit down. You know what I'm talking about? Some of you do. You guys will not. <laughs> okay. We, all we know is yes to VBS now, right? We don't get to stand up and sit down, of course. But either way, listen, I, I remember being moved for the first time. We saying, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. And for the first time, I realized this sacrifice was personal. It wasn't just a story that I'd been told. It wasn't just a fact in history. All of a sudden, I'm looking at Jesus in the eyes and I'm saying, he did that for me. I need that for me. I need the blood applied on my life. And all of a sudden it became real. But the reality is many of us have to go a long way back before we can remember what the gospel did in our life. Because for many of us it was the pinnacle of our spiritual life. When I say this often, when it's supposed to be base camp, the highlight and the spiritual highlight of your life, if it's your salvation and that was more than a month ago, then you're missing Jesus. They'd seen it all before. I got this video I want to show you, and before I show it, it's just one minute long, somewhere around a minute long. It's a story of this missionary. The the actual story is about 35 minutes long, and I won't show you all of it, just a couple clips, just a clip out of it. Story of a missionary through New Tribes Mission that went on a a mission trip, took his family away for a permanent to invest in an unreached people group. Never heard the gospel before, didn't know who Jesus was when he got there. And the story goes that he taught them all through the Bible, starting with the Garden of Eden when sin came into the world and told them how they, they understood that they were sinners and that they needed forgiveness. And we take up the story when, Mar- I think his name is Mark, the missionary, has gotten to the point where the tribal um, grandfather of the tribe finally gets it. And grandmother of the tribe finally gets it, that Jesus is their sin bearer. And no longer are they accountable to God anymore for their sin because Jesus has taken their place. I want you to watch this video, and if this doesn't move you, I don't know what will, but take a look at this and see if it moves in your heart. Village believers stating that he too believes that Christ has paid for his sins. Itao, which means it's true or it's good, it's very true. Village grandma rejoicing that he believes, so does she. Different ones giving testimony as to their belief in Christ as their sin bearer.
Mark saying that if they really are believing, then God's word says that their sin is forgiven. Itau, it's good, it's true. Spontaneous rejoicing breaks out. This went on for two and a half hours. Their country didn't win the soccer championship. Their team didn't win, their football team didn't win the national championship. Their baseball team did not storm the mound with the World Series trophy. The missionary told them, your sins are forgiven through Jesus. When's the last time you celebrated because your, friends were forgi- your, your sins were forgiven through Jesus when's the last time that you were moved with the gospel or has it become so familiar to you that you don't mo- you're not moved anymore you see I believe the church needs to wake up Listen, I understand why lost people aren't moved by the message of Jesus because they've not experienced Jesus but here's what I have a hard time understanding have a hard time understanding how we can sing to the name of Jesus. We can preach the word of God to the people, and, 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 the, and the church people sit there in the pew like they're, like they're sick. But they go on Saturdays to their football games or their baseball games, and they shout, and they storm the mound, and they celebrate, and they clap, and they yell for two and a half hours. We come to church. Like I said before, it's like they're in line for a flu shot or something. I don't get it. Why can't we be moved by the gospel anymore? Why do we find ourselves like these soldiers who are just going through the routine, just showing up to church, just showing up to Sunday school, just come once a month, just come on Sunday morning, just come, just come. Listen, do more than come to church. Don't do God a favor. Do yourself a favor. Worship the Lord Jesus Christ. He is worthy of that. We need to celebrate the gospel. Don't become so familiar with it that it loses its meaning in our lives. Jesus is worthy of our worship. Maybe you don't know the gospel. Let me talk to you just for a second. I I have a lot more sympathy for you. I understand why you don't move by the story of Jesus like I moved. Because you've not had it personally experienced in your life. I want you to know that you are a sinner if you have not trusted Jesus to forgive you of your sin. You're on a path to destruction, the Bible says. He says, for the wages of sin is death. Death. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Not one of us, because of our sin, deserves to go to heaven. Listen, whether it's homosexuality, or whether it's adultery, or whether it's pornography, or whether it's filthy talk, or whatever it happens to be, our sin separates us from God. And we're on our way to hell. But the beauty thing, beautiful thing of the gospel is that even though the wages of sin is death, the Bible goes on in that same verse and says, but the gift of God is eternal life. But let's not stop there. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's not by your own works, Ephesians says. You can't get there by being good enough. You can't come to church long enough. You can't walk an aisle enough. You can't be baptized enough. You can't go to Sunday school enough. You can't go on mission trips enough. You can't be a deacon enough. You can't be a Sunday school teacher enough. You can't be a preacher enough. The reality is, it's through Jesus that we find forgiveness of our sins. He has taken our place. He has bore our pain, as Isaiah 53 says. No longer do we have to die and be in hell. The Bible says, for those of us who believe, he gives us right to become children of God in the Gospel of John. His children, we get to be grafted into the family line of God. We've been adopted. This is the Gospel. This is the message that we need to believe and understand and experience today. There is more than what many of you are experiencing. There is more than what many of you are experiencing. 
It's not about the church. It's about Jesus. But it's all too familiar to us today. I want to give you a chance to respond to the gospel. Give your life to Jesus Christ today. I'm telling you, Jesus will save you from this direction where you're going to hell and he will send you to heaven. It's real. How do we do it? It says if we will confess with our mouth in Romans chapter 10 and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, then we'll be saved. You say, is it really that simple? Yes, it comes with repentance. You've confessed with your mouth that you believe in God, you believe in your heart, and you transfer your trust from yourself and the things of this world to God and only God, and he says, I will come into your life and save you. I will send you on a different path, a different direction. This is the gospel message today that these people were celebrating on this video. That's why they were celebrating, because it was real. Second reason these Roman soldiers, I believe, were completely oblivious to the greatest, the greatest story being lived out for, the, for them they've ever experienced was this, prejudice. Prejudice. They were turned off by God's people. They were turned off by God's people. Now in this day, the Israelites were God's people. And I want you to understand there was a great prejudice between the Romans and between the Jews. They hated one another. Prejudice can make us do terrible things. History reminds us of this. The 60s and 70s are terrible reminders of that fact. The 1800s are terrible reminders of this fact. See, I've been raised in a generation that's one generation removed from the civil rights movements of the 70s. For the most part, I was raised to see people and not color. I was raised to see people. I mean, that's just, everybody's just people. That's how I was raised. And so while race, race relations have a, a lot of room for improvement, both with whites, blacks, Hispanics, and all across the board, you can go to other countries and see the exact same thing, we have made major strides, at least in the right direction. There's still more room to grow. But over the past month, my son, Ross, has been, he's a five-year-old in uh, Kitty Stone at kindergarten, and they've been talking about Dr. Martin Luther King. And it's amazed me to be able to live this uh, story in the life of a five-year-old for the first time who knows nothing about color of skin. He sees people. He doesn't see color. Never taught him to see color. He just sees people, all right? And so I say all this to say he got to the story about um, the story of Rosa Parks. If you want to know about the story of Rosa Parks, talk to Ross. He'll tell you everything you need to know about Rosa Parks. I was preparing this morning. I prepare audibly for my messages. And I was reading some stuff off my notes this morning. He said, show me in your notes where my name is, you know? He said, I do know everything about Rosa Parks, and I know everything about Dr. Martin Luther King. But listen, what amazed me about this story is how appalled he was at the prejudice of our country, of our past. And I began to tell him that uh, some, uh, about a month ago that you know, when, his, when his grandparents were being raised, that, that you know, there, was a, there was a water fountain for colored people and a water fountain for white people. And there was a, there was a spot on a bus for a white person but not for a black person. And, and all these different things that I began to talk about, different bathrooms and different schools and all these, these horrible things that have happened in our past. And you should have just seen his face just drop. He was appalled. It was horrible to him to be able to think that someone could do something else like this. To some other person. It's so irrational. It's so stupid to mistreat someone based upon their color. But in this time, this is what was going on. The Jews, they hated the Romans, and the Romans hated the Jews. And every time the Jew could, could some of the Jews, radicals, they would have uh, knives in their pocket. They were known to come stab Roman soldiers as they walked by in a crowd. They were known to get them off by themselves and kill them. And the same was true for the Romans. They would yell racial slurs and look at them as inferior people and all the different things that were going on in the time. And so it's not absurd for us to look at this story and say, these, these soldiers are probably looking at it away. This is why I can get back at those Jews that's been mistreating me all my life. Right? You with me? They hated him. It's probably easy to nail those nails in. It's probably easy to put that crown of thorns and beat him uh, against a whipping post. Prejudiced. They were turned off by the people of God. Can I tell you this? These people were so prejudiced against the people of God that they couldn't see the Savior dying on the cross for their sins. Maybe you're lost and you're here this morning. And you are so prejudiced against God's people because of what they have done to you in some form or some fashion or what you've seen about the church or what you've seen in a Christian that you say, I don't want anything to do with their God. 
You see, these Roman soldiers, they're sitting there looking at Jesus down on the cross, and they, they can just spew hatred toward them because of how they've been treated, their family's been treated. And in the exact same way, maybe you have these stories in your life of someone that's hurt you, someone in the church that's cheated you, someone that has mis- mistreated somebody in your family because of what they wore to church or how they did this or how they did that. And the reality is, is many people in our world are turned off from the church because of Christians. You do a survey and you look around and find out what lost people and unchurched people think about the church, two things will pop up. First of all, they'll say, church is boring, and I don't see why in the world I'd need that in my life. Okay, first of all, that's what they would say. It's just boring. I don't see why in the world I need that in life. It doesn't really matter. Second thing they'll say, why they don't go to church if they don't go, is because they know Christians and they don't like Christians. Read the book Unchristian. It's out there today. Find out what lost people think about the church. We don't have to guess what they think. They're telling us what they think. By the way, churches are plateauing and decline at over 70% of our churches are in a plateau or decline. You think they're plateauing and declining because things are exciting in them and because people are getting saved and because people are living for Christ? Or do you think they're plateaued and declining because people aren't getting saved, people aren't, church is not exciting, and the Christian people are not living for Jesus? You answer the question for me this morning. There's people in our world that are prejudiced against the church. They're actually prejudiced against God because of the church, because of the people. The stories go on and on. I have them listed here, things that I've read. One guy said, I got a divorce and my church wouldn't remarry me. Later I found out an official of the church was arrested for abusing children. One woman said, the only time I saw my dad cry was when he told how his mother went to the church for help during the Depression. She came home in tears because the church turned her down. My dad couldn't get over how hurt his mother was, and from that day on, he was indifferent toward the church. Talk about from the 30s. (laughs) Lasting impressions in people's lives. Maybe you're here and you say, I'll just be honest, I don't like the church. I don't think I like Jesus because I've seen Christians. Please don't judge Jesus by what you see in the Christians. Can I just say that? I know you ought to be because Christian means Christ-like. But please, it just does not work in a perfect world like that. I mean, in a perfect world like that. Listen, give Jesus a chance. I know you can't taste and see that the Lord is good because you can't get out of the taste of the bitterness of the church in your mouth. I understand that. I can sympathize with that. Listen, if I left this church or any other church every time somebody hurt me or, I got my, or somebody, something didn't go my way, I'd probably never be in church. I don't come to church because of the people. I come to church, most importantly, because of the Savior. All right? I do come because there's some great people in the church. But my relationship with God cannot depend upon my relationship with the person in the pew beside me. It can't. You remember Zacchaeus, the story of Zacchaeus? Listen, Zacchaeus was a wealthy tax collector in Jericho. He learned that Jesus was coming to the city. He wanted to go up and see him. But listen, he couldn't see him because of the crowd. Do you remember the story? And so he went and he found this sycamore tree. He climbed up that sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. You know the song. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and said, Zacchaeus, you come down for I'm going to your house to say. I say thank God for the tree that got Zacchaeus up over the crowd. So he could see Jesus. Can I, can I tell you something? If you're lost here, you're saying, I'm not sure about the church. Maybe you're saved, but you're unchurched. You've just come back for some reason today. The reality is, listen, climb up in the tree, look over the crowd, and look to Jesus. You will not go wrong. You'll go wrong by looking at me or anybody else. Look at Jesus. In fact, Hebrews says in Hebrews 12, verses 1 and following, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, it says this, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Look to Jesus. Don't, Don't look at your neighbor. Don't look at the church. Look at Jesus. Third thing, why, 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 did these people, why did these soldiers, why couldn't they see Jesus? Why, couldn't they, why, why were they distracted? Why did they dismiss Jesus? Well, number three, because they were distracted. They were focused on other things. Verse 24 tells us that here they're focused on gambling for clothes. They're looking for this tunic, and they're trying to figure out who's going to get the tunic, the prized possession of this man who is fixing to die. They're distracted. 
Christians, lost people who don't know Jesus, let me tell you something. We've got a lot in the world that will distract us from seeing the most important things. There's a lot of things that will distract us from seeing Jesus. I mean, you've seen the paintings of Jesus dying on the cross. You know what the soldiers are doing? They're all looking down, gambling. They're not looking up at Jesus. The family, his mother was looking up at Jesus. The disciples were looking up at Jesus. The soldiers were looking down. They're so busy figuring out how they can make a name for themselves, grab something else in their possession, that they missed the Jesus hanging on the cross, the Savior of the world. They were so oblivious to the fact of what was happening. Distractions. They were focused on other things. We're so distracted by other things. I don't know if you have, uh, I think I have some symptoms of ADD. I got in trouble in seminary one time by saying, I think I have ADD because the professor said, I'm a doctor. Have you been, you know, have you been tested and all this? And I, and I haven't been tested, but my wife will tell you I probably share some resemblance of people who have this. Okay, and some of you don't have to say amen. I'd like to go with a little bit of positive outlook for today, okay? But I don't know about you, but I, I can be focused in on something one second, and the next minute I am way off. I mean, I can, like, like Kyle Ottoman gave this story, uh, and it's something I was reading from him, and he was like, you know, one moment I'm in, the, I'm in the moment of communion, and I'm saying, God, thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And I, maybe you've been like this. I can see myself here. And it's like, now, now I'm praying this, and I'm saying, oh, God, you know, I was just so ugly to my, my wife yesterday. And God, forgive me. I realize your sacrifice on the cross is giving me forgiveness, and I need forgiveness for this. And I'm about to take it to the Lord's Supper, and the next thing I'm thinking, oh, I need to have date night with my wife. You know, we haven't had date night in a while. And the next moment I'm thinking, oh, I can't have date night tomorrow because Ross has got t-ball practice. And then I'm thinking, oh, well, you know, he really needs to work on his pop fly. You know, like I need to throw him some pop flies. And I've gone from a moment of communion where I'm communing with God, and 15 seconds later I'm thinking about catching pop flies with my boy. Have you ever done that? <laughs> Good. I, I will not go see counselor when I leave here. <laughs> right? But I get so distracted with the world sometimes. But I miss the most important things. There's a story that goes about this man who was in charge of keeping a light burning in a lighthouse. And he would sit up, and he was, his job was to keep it going. And his, the, the guy that was in charge told him, said, listen, I'm leaving you in charge. You only have enough oil for the month. Don't let the light go out. Do, do not misuse the oil. And this person come in, and she said, my children are hungry. I need some oil so I can cook. And he gave him some. And the other person said, my engine needs some oil. And so he gave him some. And come the end of the month, he ran out of oil. Because he was doing some good things with it. But the problem was two ships collided into rocks on the nights that the, the light was not on. And a hundred people, the story goes, were killed. Some, somewhere around a hundred people were killed. And so he goes back to give an answer and the, his boss says, what in the world is going on? Why did you run out of oil? And he said, but I gave it to these people who were needy. I felt moved to do these things. And he said, but you forgot the most important thing, which was to keep the light burning. If we're not careful, we get so busy doing important things that we miss the most important thing. Paul is preaching, and he gives some scripture that I kind of want to close to. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, he's teaching to the Corinthian church, and he says this, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. Here's what he's saying. The most important thing I'm about to give to you, okay, of which I have received. Here it is. That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That he was buried. And that he raised again on the third day. Paul says this is the most important. You see, we get so busy that we've missed Jesus. We've lost sight of the crucifixion, whether it's prejudice, whether it's distractions, whether it's familiarity. We've lost sight of Jesus. Maybe like the soldiers, you've dismissed Jesus for some of these reasons or others. But I want you just to just invite you to stop right here where you are today and look up at the cross. Maybe you've heard the story a thousand times. Maybe you've been turned off by Christians. Maybe you've got a lot going on in your life. I'm going to ask you to do something. Would you just do this as the old song says? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. 
you just bow your head and close your eyes? I believe this message is for some people here this morning. Listen, I, I've never been so convinced that there are people here who need to experience Jesus in a new way this morning. And so here's what I, I ask you to do. I ask you just to be obedient to whatever God's told you to do. In a moment of invitation, I can't convince you to do anything. Listen, if the Savior of the world and the Holy Spirit of God can't move you, I can't, some preacher can't move you. I'm not trying to move you today. I want God to move you because if God moves you, you'll really change. You won't go back. For, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have gone. Behold, all things have been made new. The reality is, some of you need to be changed by Jesus today because the old things will be gone and the new things will come. So I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to invite you to respond. Some of you need Jesus for the first time. You're lost, you're on your way to hell, and you realize it maybe for the first time today that you've seen Jesus, you know about Jesus, but you don't know Jesus. Better yet, Jesus don't, doesn't know you. So don't ask yourself, do I know Jesus? The better way to ask this question in the familiarity of the South that we have with the gospel is, does Jesus know me? I like that song that said, he, he knows my name. Does Jesus know your name? Is it written down in the Lamb's Book of Life? Does he, are you bought with the blood of Jesus? If so, the Bible is very clear that there's life change and there's fruit in your life. So evaluate that. Maybe you need Jesus. I'd love to talk with you. Brother Jim would love to talk to you. Brother Casey would love to talk to you. There's other members in our congregation who would love to share with you Jesus. So you come. Maybe you're here and you are a believer. But boy, you needed a fresh glimpse of the Savior today. Then would you come? I invite you to bow at this altar. Just, just confess to the Lord Jesus. Just say, hey, listen, God, you know my heart. So you're going to know what I'm about to say before I say it. But, man, I've been callous to the gospel. And today, I want it to be new. I want to taste and see that you are good. And I want it to motivate and mobilize me for the sake of your great name into the world. God, I pray you'd move in this place. I pray you'd break down the barriers that may be here. God, in the lives of people, that God, you would let them peel their hands off the back of the pews just to be obedient. Pull, God, would you just move in their hearts like you've moved in my heart this week? I pray that you would do great things and great things would happen as a result of us seeing and experiencing you today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.